Thanks to everyone that has commented on our videos, shared them, make sure you like them, and then let everybody else know that they can get a little dose of railroad history each and every day by coming here. If you're not watching these videos, you're probably watching something else online and maybe you've gone to the America's Funniest Home videos and you've seen the viral video about the people trying to fake a slip on a banana peel, only to really go down hard. It's really late. Not that what that person needed was traction or friction. Friction is a good thing when you're trying not to slip on a banana peel, but it's a bad thing when you're pulling an 18,000 ton train, then you want to minimize friction and you want to make that surface in the bearing as slippery as walking on a banana peel. So here is your new word for today, tripology. That is the study of friction and that's what we're going to do now. So here's what they did to minimize friction on the railroads. You have the wheel and you have what's known as the axle. Now the axle sits between two brass bearing blocks. So they come on top and on bottom. So what they look like is this. This is the top and the car rests on this. And this is the bottom piece. The axle would ride right in here and another piece would be on top. And that makes up the bearing. And you can see it right here. In the rest of what is called the journal box, which holds the bearing and the axle, is a pit of oil. And the oil had a wick, or rags or cotton, that wicked the oil up to lubricate the top and bottom bearings around the axle. And of course, you'd have to fill that up on a regular basis. And you'd have to check it on a regular basis. For instance, the Duluth Misabi and Iron Range Railway had a basic rule that they would oil every one of their ore cars once every 10 days. How many ore cars did they have? About 10,000. So this was very labor intensive and quite honestly sometimes that oil would catch on fire in a hot pot situation and burn up the rags and the cotton which was a natural wick hence the name and you'd have a fire which could burn down the entire car. The other big disadvantage was in the name of this it was called a friction bearing. Well, how does that make any sense? That's an oxymoron. That's like uh, army intelligence or jumbo shrimp or, uh, in our case, nonprofit corporation. So they needed a new name, they needed a new way, and they needed to get away from the word friction and bearing. And somebody had a better idea. The guy with the better idea was Henry Timken. Mr. Timken was born in Germany and emigrated to the United States. He left the family farm in Missouri and got a job working with a carriage manufacturer. And he was very good at it. He, in 1855, started his own carriage manufacturing company in St. Louis. And there he invented a revolutionary carriage spring to make the ride smoother and it made him a lot of money. Once he had the spring thing down, he started to work on the friction and reducing it in the wheel bearing. And he came up with the Timken ball bearing, called the roller bearing today. And what he did was he made it in a cone shape so that it fit into the housing and is actually a cone and it's non-lubricated. It just has roller bearings. The friction was reduced dramatically and they started using it on the railroads as well as on carriages. It was a great idea. It not only reduced the friction by half, in other words you used half as much energy to pull a train load of cars that had roller bearings as opposed to a train full of cars with friction bearings. And you didn't have all that maintenance every day of having to check the oil to make sure they didn't catch on fire and burn up your car. Now still you can have hot boxes and that's what these are called when they go bad. You can still have them but they're much less common today on roller bearings than they were back in the day with the old friction bearings. The Santa Fe Railway was actually the first one to use the Timken bearing right after the turn of the century on their passenger cars and they advertised it as a smoother, quieter, and much safer ride than the old friction bearing, which by this time is getting a bad name. In 1948, the Timken Company is now making roller bearings all for passenger cars. But in 48, for the Chicago Rail Fair, they premiered something new and that was a roller bearing, a Timken roller bearing, for freight cars and they became very popular and took off from there on. Everybody now using roller bearings as opposed to the old friction bearings. So much so that today's railroads won't even allow a friction bearing to be operated on their tracks. 
Remember one of the things I told you about Mr. Timken was that his first big invention, which he made a lot of money on, was the carriage spring? Next time you're watching a train go by at a crossing, here's something you can look for on the springs of a train car. If the springs are compressed, it means there's something in the car that's heavy and weighing the springs down. If you see the springs are apart or expanded, well, it means the car is empty. So as the train is going by, you can say, well, that car is full and that one's empty. Hey, we're full of these stories, so we've got plenty more coming your way every single day. In the meantime, please like them, share them, and whatever you do, well, you know what to do. You wash your hands, you cover your coughs, you don't touch your face, keep your social distance, and you're doing it. Let's take care of each other.